All right, good morning, everyone. Trust you're all back from connection time. Those that aren't, let's reconnect in here. And if you're at home, uh, just, yeah, so good to be here today. Lovely to be with you folks here in the room and uh, online. And so uh, we are excited now to kind of get back into our teaching series. And uh, this is going to be a good day today. And so we are switching stuff up a little tiny bit uh, today, but I love to do that once in a while. I like to keep stuff fresh, love to keep you interested. So uh, just so you are aware, as we've been kind of looking at uh, the types and different personalities and different personalities in the Bible and that kind of stuff, I want you to know that different personalities can get along. They can. And so uh, myself, as I kind of look at my personality, I'm more of a type one reformer. We talked about last week. We'll hear more about today. Uh, and Yvonne is more of a type six loyalist. She is loyal no matter what goes wrong. She will stick in no matter what goes off the rail. She's there. She's committed. She's in. When she says she's in, she's in. No matter what happens, she's there. And I'm thankful for that today because today is our 24th wedding anniversary. So, um, and I think it's only because she's a type six loyalist. She's in because I've dragged her through lots of stuff. <laughs> Ministry's taken us all across the world, and there's days when I've come downstairs from the bedroom and said to Yvonne, hey, Yvonne, what do you think about doing a missionary stint in Africa? And Yvonne's reply was, when do you want to have the yard sale? <laughs> Honest story. Uh, Yvonne is a loyalist. She is loyal to our relationship and our calling and our ministry and all that. And, uh, and I just want to take a moment today to embarrass you, my dear, <laughs> on our 24th wedding. Next year's a big one. It is. Oh, yeah. Next year's a big one. But today is a great day, too. So, um, so today we're going to jump into this series we've been doing called You and Discovering You and Christ in You. And we've been talking about different personalities, and we've been rooting that in the Bible in case you've been watching. And so today we're going to take a little bit of a turn. So what we're going to do is today I want to introduce you to... Uh, an eight, a nine, and a one in our community. So we've taken the time to teach on these three uh, personality types from Scripture. If you've missed that, go back to YouTube and check it out. But today I want to I talk to uh, some of the folks in our community with these personalities. And so we're going to do that uh, in a few different ways. So we're going to have a couple of interviews right here. We're going to have an interview on screen in a moment. Uh, and we're just going to briefly introduce you to how people reflect as an eight, a nine, or a one, how they reflect on the relationship with themselves, how they see themselves, uh, how they reflect on the relationship with other people, uh, how they get along with others, and obviously how they see God, which is super, super important. So today is going to be a good day. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I can't wait to uh, kind of look into this a little bit. These eights, nines, and ones, they, are, they go together uh, because they kind of process the world by their gut, by instinct. It's kind of just what happens. It's what they feel. It's, it's what is in their gut. Uh, and there's a, there's a core emotional piece that connects with these folks too, uh, about anger. An eight, not, an eight just kind of externalizes it, makes all kinds of crazy stuff happen. Lots of times it's good stuff. Uh, a nine piece maker kind of doesn't want to make everyone, anyone around them offended, so they kind of push it down and push it down so everyone gets along until it explodes sometimes. And the type one, they're just perpetually frustrated with people that kind of don't do stuff the right way. Uh, and their anger might not blow up, but you sense it in their frustration, maybe even with you. So uh, that's a core piece here that's similar to these folks. So we are going to talk to these three folks together. So uh, today, our first conversation uh, with a type eight challenger. And, and I want to say, I always want to say, these people exhibit behaviors associated with this type. I never want to box someone in and say, this is who they are. So. Uh, we are going to look at uh, this person who exhibits uh, behaviors of a type 8 challenger, and uh, it's going to come to you via screen. Uh, so let's check that out for the next seven minutes. We're going to check that out uh, right now. All right. So uh, today I'm happy to introduce all of you to Janice Burke. And Janice has been here at Hillside for, for quite some time, and she identifies with some of the traits of a type 8 Challenger. Now, uh, Janice had to work this weekend, otherwise she would be here because she's always here. Uh, but today she's agreed to sit down for this kind of little interview chit chat uh, this way. So this is great. So Janice, uh, the type 8 challenger we talked about a few weeks ago, when we went into the Bible, we talked about the biblical personality of Deborah in the book of Judges. 
So how did that character kind of resonate with you when you heard that story and you kind of thought about some aspects of your own personality? I relate well uh, to Deborah because we both have the same passion and enthusiasm to just go and meet challenges head on. Barack knew what God wanted him to do, but he was holding back and she was impatient with him. That's how I would have felt. Mm, so the impatience piece uh, for a type eight challenger is kind of a thing. Very new, yeah. yeah, you feel that a lot? Yeah, when, when I feel that uh, there, there's things that should be done or things that uh, um, when I, I see people that uh, have needs or their needs aren't met, I, I just get impatient with people around me. Um, mm. um, and, and because I just, um, I just go do it. And right. so I just don't understand sometimes how people can't have the same mm -hmm. ideas. Sometimes, and it came out in the message too, sometimes like the type eight will see stuff other people don't really see in the moment. And because they see it first, they just kind of want to, let's go do this. But everybody else kind of in the moment, or maybe not everybody else, but a lot of people just hadn't seen it yet. So that's a very typical thing for a type A challenger. And you said that's something that you kind of wrestle with. So Yeah, and some people say, oh, we have to plan to change it. And it's like when I see a need that needs to be filled now or changed now, okay, we can do planning, but you know, there are some things that need to right. be addressed. Right. And, uh, and then when I don't see it addressed, mm. it just causes it, me a lot of distress. <laughs> it gets under your skin, <laughs> yeah. for sure. That is definitely type eight behavior, for sure. So each of us, you know, we've got our own, in our own types, our own personality, we've got our own beauty, and we've got our own brokenness as a part of our type. So as you kind of process through what it means to be a type eight challenger, uh, you've identified, yeah, these are some of the things I can see in me. Um, what are some of the things or what's one thing uh, that you you're, you work hard to guard yourself against or you are working hard to kind of guard yourself against? Because we've all got these things that we kind of got to figure out how to, how to, how to control them. So what's, what's your thing with the type 8 uh, behavior? Um, I have a very strong sense of how I feel people should be treated and what's right and wrong. Um, mm. Because I have a nurturing heart, I... Uh, to quote a work made of mine, uh, my mama bear comes out when I see injustice. Um, uh, I've, I've had uh, people call me to accountability and say, you know, what you said was valid, but the way you said it was not. Ah. I need to really work on that. Ah. Um, uh, I've learned that because my anger flares up and sometimes I don't pick my words carefully, I write letters to people when I know conflict is going to happen and mm. things that I need to bring out, well, feel I need to bring out, um, I know I'm not going to bring it out properly. Mm. So I tend to write it because then I can kind of like uh, rewrite it and get it right so that the, the, the ideas are there, but um, I don't get the emotion into it. Uh -huh. I assume that's taken you some time to learn because... It's taken me a long time to learn. <laughs> <laughs> because that is, that is actually, uh, that's healthy type 8 behavior. Unhealthy type 8 behavior would just be, I don't need accountability, we're doing this thing, I'm going to say what I want, and it's just going to come out, right? Uh, and I'm sure probably there's been times in your life as a type eight that that may have happened earlier on for sure. But you've kind of like accountability is a big word uh, for a type eight person. They need accountability in their lives. And you've already kind of identified that that's a piece that kind of saves you in some ways. Yeah, I, I had an um, um, a, a older gentleman at our church that uh, um, would uh, in meetings would uh, come to me and say, you know what, God spoke to you, um, your, what you said was valid, but the way you said it wasn't. Yeah. And he would continue to do that. And I would find that people wouldn't listen to what I had to say because mm. of the way I said it. Mm. And so uh, he really helped me a lot to uh, just be able to articulate what I needed to say, but kind of hold on to the anger. And um. I find that in, in, um, in work, when you're you've got to be professional mm -hmm. um, and my anger rises yes. that I, I need to kind of um, like either back out for a few minutes and then come back to the situation or the best thing is to write it out and then present it right. to my bosses that way. Mm. And then, and then we can discuss it afterwards when the anger is gone. <laughs> wow. So type eight out there listening. That's a good tip. If you're kind of trying to figure out how to process some of the things that just kind of come to me and I want to do them now, it's always good to, wasn't the Bible says, um, in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom, right? Yeah. And so when lots of times when the type 8 sees something that maybe other people don't see, that's uh, still a really good, solid spiritual practice to say, hey, these are some of the ways I'm feeling. What do you all think before you just move, right? And so you've learned that. So that's, that's amazing. So when it comes to how you experience God, your personal relationship with God, 
how does how do you uh, how do you experience that through your filter of being a type eight challenger? How do you how do you see God? How does that kind of affect your spiritual walk? Um, because I know that God knows my motives, I can have a very open and honest relationship with God. Um, I can vent to him when I need to, and that helps me to sort out my feelings because I find that, like, you know, he can take it and um, I, I, I can process um, mm -hmm. by uh, prayer. Um, uh, I have been, uh, sometimes when I've been overwhelmed with feelings and I can't really uh, find the words to say to express myself, so I pray, God, just read my heart. Uh -huh. And I find that when I say that, then the words start to come and, um, and, uh, and then my prayer can have deep emotion. Mm. <laughs> um, no, I find that sometimes, uh, uh, God uses me in, in ministry because I can be very open, honest, and direct, and I can deal with things that need to, I feel that need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. However, it has con con caused conflict with people in the church at times. <laughs> right. So, um, I have to be mindful of, you know, that we all think differently and that, uh, um, um, but I, I, I still feel that sometimes things need to be, uh, directly dealt with. Yeah. One of the things I like, really like what you just said is, you know, I know when I have these things built up and I just need to say it, you can say it to God and God can take it. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, so true. And, uh, maybe there's times when, you know, because of the context or, uh, the situation you find yourself in, maybe it's not the healthiest thing to do is to just say it, but you can take it to God and say it. And, and like God's not afraid of those things. So, so this has been super, super great. Uh, thank you for sharing a little bit of the type eight with us today. And we are so thankful for folks like you in our church and our workplaces and our families. We need type eight challengers. And uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing with us today, Janice. All right. So she scores a plus for honesty, a plus for honesty there. Uh, boy, I appreciated that conversation. Lots of great stuff came out there. I could teach on that thing for the next 20 minutes, but I won't. But, boy, the type 8 challenger just wants to say it. There's something wrong, so just say it. Just put it out there, and not everyone's ready for it. Sometimes they say it, and people get offended. It happens. I know it never happens in church, but it happens everywhere else. <laughs> the cool thing she said was, when, I, when, when people can't take it, I know God can take it. Mm. Go to God and say it. Because there's some stuff, type 8 challenger, that maybe the rest of us aren't ready for yet in the moment. Give us a chance. We'll warm up to it. And you don't know what to do with what you got to say. Go to God. Say it to, say it to God. God can take it. I love that. So that was some great stuff. So uh, we are going to move along right now to, uh, to our type 9 peacemaker. And I'm going to ask uh, John to come forward. And he's just back there chomping at the bit to get up here today. <laughs> Peacemakers love to get... Uh, lo love to talk about this stuff. So, John, come and take a seat. And um, I think your mic should be on. Just give it a, a quick hello. I shouldn't need to touch anything. Hello. There you go, my friend. So, uh, welcome to John today. And John, uh, after a message one Sunday morning, John kind of came to me and said, I think I identify with some of the Type 9 Peacemaker stuff, but I got some of the one in me and, and that kind of stuff. And and unless, you know, you don't want to be interviewed on stage, don't tell me what type you are, uh, because you could end up here, <laughs> which is great. I, lo I love that. Uh, so, so thank you, John, for telling me where you kind of lean, and, uh, and thanks for being here today. So the teaching on the type 9 peacemaker, if you missed it, uh, took us towards the biblical personality of Abraham. So as, we, as you heard that, and as you think about the character that we kind of rolled through on the Abraham story, what parts of that story resonated with you strongly? Uh, as you heard that teaching and you kind of heard the Abraham pieces, what kind of pieces in there kind of made you realize that, oh, I think that I've got lots of this in me for sure. So share with us, John. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, it's just been great to have a new way of uh, looking at myself and uh, Looking at the story, what the study that we did, um, I probably identify most with that situation with uh, Abraham and his nephew Lot, mm. where they were realized that the country could not support them all in the same place. So Abraham tells Lot to uh, choose where he wants to go, and that Abraham would take uh, the rest. But where I got into difficulty was. I wasn't sure where I identified with his doing that to avoid conflict or just 
doing that because, well, that's just the thing you do because mm. Paul teaches us to look out for other people's interests more mm. than our own. Uh, I remember distinctly a time where I realized that, John, you know what? You don't need the biggest pork chop at the meal. You can have the smaller one. And it's good. You've got enough. So I'm not sure if I'm <laughs> fitting in completely with the nine here, but definitely that idea of keeping the peace mm. was very important to me. And so that's the part with Abraham that I identified with the most. Each of us um, has our own beauty and our brokenness as, as we chatted to Janice about stuff in, in her type. Uh, and so as we kind of reflect on the type nine peacemaker, you don't need the biggest pork chop. Not because you probably don't want it. <laughs> Do you want it? Uh, you know what? <laughs> Actually, not even anymore. Okay. Because you're not even, <laughs> well, you want to keep everybody else happy. Yeah. Well, there's one of the things that I need to tell you this. After you are doing your best to walk with God for 45 years, mm. you start to change a little bit. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, and th isn't that like what we're supposed to do, yeah. right? It's uh, walking in faith with Jesus and growing with Jesus. And, and like Henry Nouwen said, as I kind of quoted at the beginning of this series, like, are you getting older? As you get older, are you getting older or, or, or are you getting older and becoming more like Jesus? Because there's a difference. Because you can just be in the church and get older. Right? So the question we want to ask around here is, as you grow older, are you becoming more like Christ? Which is what, obviously, God wants for all of us. So, so as you kind of process like the broken side of some of the stuff that happens in the life of a type 9 peacemaker, what is it in you that you see? Or, or what is it in you that you've guarded against? Or what is it in you that maybe you've learned that's new that you think, oh, I need to guard against that thing? Well, one of the things, um, well, you know, we're, we love peace. We love peace of mind. And I have to make sure that I don't back down when a conflict or a confrontation is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, guess I kind of, I can just pull back into myself and it doesn't matter so much. But, you know, for the overall church, atmosphere. I need to be strong and do that. And the other part maybe is a tendency to disengage a little bit, mm -hmm. to be there, but to not really be there and just be in my own mind thinking about yes. stuff. Here's one of the things, John, about uh, type nine peacemakers and folks and people at home watching. Uh, type nine peacemakers oftentimes have some of the best ideas of all of us. Because they've stopped, they've processed, they've thought about what's good for the other, not necessarily what's best for me. they thought about the community. they thought about people in my small group. they thought about people in the congregation. they thought about others first. And because of that, they oftentimes have fantastic ideas for the group or for the church or, or for your workplace or for your family or whatever. But because lots of times they want what's best for you, they won't kind of put out there what's, what they want. And there's times when you need to do that. It's, it's important for us to know that the type 9 peacemaker has needs themselves. Uh, and so one of the things that John's kind of getting at here is like, it's healthy for you to say, I actually would like for us to do this or to think about this. And there's actually, sometimes it's okay to say, I want the biggest poor job. Uh, that's okay. It's not a sin against God. It's, it's, it's okay. Well, but, but that's I'll a core thing a, for sure. i can give you an example of that. Uh, everybody, every granddad is really excited about their first grandchild. And so I did what I should do and asked God for a healthy grandchild. And I could never finish that with, God, I want a healthy grandchild, but I want a boy. Uh, <laughs> see, the peacemaker wants stuff, and that's okay. But they always want what's best for us first. How could we get along? without you folks. There was another thing I wanted to add. Um, as I went through the different levels of development in a number nine person, I found it interesting that the weaknesses, the brokenness that you see in the, uh, I don't know, lesser well-functioning number nines, if you yeah. can say that, yeah. were some of the things in scripture 
some of the admonitions that I really found that they worked. Mm. I could just, because it was my type kind of, it was easy to obey those. Yeah, that makes sense. Become, yeah. So John, tell us uh, lastly, um, you know, as you, as you relate to God, you know, as you relate to God as a, as a type nine peacemaker, how do you feel? And maybe, you know, if you're just learning this, I, mean, I don't expect you to kind of have it all figured out because it's a lifetime journey for all of us. But as you kind of process how you relate to God through this filter of being a person that just wants to make peace, how do you, how do you, how does that affect the way you see God? Well, um, I, I think that I've, feel at peace with myself and I feel at peace with God and it seems to be real just a good connection but what I want to do all the time and it's spilled out into my life with other people as well is I want to keep very short accounts because that that peace is important it's it's no fun when I'm hanging on to a sin in my life mm. or something that I shouldn't be doing mm. and it's hindering my relationship with God or also with other people's. This happened a lot when I was teaching. You know, um, sometimes as adults, because we are just better at life, can take advantage of a young child and mm -hmm. put them in their place or do something that's not kind. And I found, or make a comment that's not right, but you just had to deal with that right away. Don't let it sit. And so, that, you know, I'm, like you said, I'm still working on that thing of how, as a number nine, I relate to God. Mm -hmm. But I think peace of mind and that peace comes from keeping things right with God is, is important. To me. And, and the thing is about, uh, true of many type nine peacemakers is you need to be at peace uh, with others, you need to be at peace with God, but you need to be at peace with yourself. And if those other pieces aren't in play, you're not at peace with yourself. And that is why it will drive you crazy. So, so John, thank you, for, um, thank you for giving us this little glimpse. Let's give John a hand. And uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, now I'm going to ask uh, Tora to come up for a few moments. And Tora is going to chat with us for a few moments about what it feels like to uh, exhibit lots of the traits of the type one reformer. So if you were here uh, last week, you would have heard kind of fresh uh, in, in terms of what some of the traits of this kind of type are like. And I tried to present that for, in a very non-biased perspective <laughs> last week uh, because that's kind of where I find myself. So I tried to kind of stay biased, but now I'm asking Tora to step in and be very biased. Tell us, like, who you are in through this filter and what that kind of looks like for you. So last week, we looked at the biblical personality of the elder's son in the prodigal son's story. And if you missed it, I think that it would be a good one for you to reconnect uh, with. So as you heard that being unpacked last week, uh, and you kind of heard some of the attitudes and some of the mentalities of this elder brother, what was going through your mind as you were hearing that? Well, where do I begin? <laughs> um, uh, a number of things, but one of the first things was um, I resonated with his sense of urgent and undeniable responsibility. And for the elder brother, his responsibility was to his father, his family, and the family's work. Um, because being responsible is the right way to behave. I also resonated with how he begrudged his younger brother's ability to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Oh, my younger brother can just go off and enjoy and play and be free, and there's a sense of envying that. Um, but most of all, and uh, I think I'm nervous because I'm burying my soul here, um, I resonated with the older brother's sense of injustice and indignation at not being recognized for his good and faithful work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's rooted, I think, in a desire to be loved and recognized and appreciated. And it's also rooted in a misguided belief that I need to earn approval and belonging. So I'm sure that there's probably more people in this room and more people listening besides you and I that feel like that. Uh, there's tons of people that fall in this 
type one reformer kind of piece where they just feel the heavy responsibility, but there's also affirmation is important. And we feel that it kind of doesn't come very much. But when it does, it absolutely means a lot. And, and I think that's an important thing to recognize about uh, the, the body of Jesus. Uh, and so some people kind of like, uh, some people don't need that in, in that way, but some people do. And sometimes it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's, you, it's a tap on the shoulder for the things that aren't seen. Right? So for like this morning, we kind of like saw, we saw your service, right? But there's tons of stuff behind the scene that type ones do that no one kind of sees. And in lots of ways, I don't want to say the majority of, but certainly a lot of. And so that's the kind of pieces where, you know, the elder, someone's in the field working, no one's watching him, and it's like, hey, like, what about, what about me? And so that's okay to feel that way. I think it's knowing each other's needs in the body and meeting those needs. It's kind of what makes the body work. And I think when a type one receives genuine appreciation, not for their own glory necessary, mm. necessarily, but just an acknowledgement of thank you for being you and thank you for being a gift. Yeah. Um, it keeps type ones, or at least keeps me from spinning my wheels mm. in trying to just do more, be more, mm. and it just helps me to take a breath and, and feel accepted and at peace yeah. with myself. Yeah. So I, l I just love, I love that story about the prodigal son and the mm -hmm. elder brother in there. Just so much in there. And so uh, as you consider, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've had some experience and background with the Enneagram stuff, so this is not new to you. Uh, but as you've had years to process the beauty and the brokenness of what it means to be you through a type one filter, what's some of the brokenness that you've had to kind of like guard against or you're constantly guarding against or that you're even newly becoming aware of? And, and how does that how does that get brought forward? Well, um, beauty and brokenness are two sides of a double-edged sword. I think for all types, there's the thing like the thing that makes us tick, and if we're doing it healthfully, it's a beautiful thing. And if it's unhealthy, it hurts people. Um, and I think the beauty of a one is that um, type ones are able to see almost instinctively at a gut level in a situation what might need to be done to get from point A to point B. Um, a one will never hesitate to leap into the gap. Um, they see a need and they will just, they'll be the first ones to dive in. And so that's what makes ones really good leaders and visionaries. But the brokenness of that mm. is that type ones, we will pursue getting from point A to point B at all costs. Mm. At all costs to ourselves and at all costs to other people. Mm. Um, so if I have a time for a short story, um, I volunteered in a kitchen at a family retreat center for a couple summers um, after I graduated from undergrad. And, you know, I was just, you know, here, chop 10 gallons of onions. Okay. <laughs> um, but after a couple weeks there, uh, one of the lead, they needed a lead cook, so they asked me to substitute as a lead cook, even though it was my first summer. And I was like, oh, cool. I get to tell people what to chop. <laughs> um, and so I was having fun. And then about halfway through the shift, a friend of mine who was volunteering there with me pulled me aside. And he said, um, you are amazing at this. That's why they asked you. And everyone wants to see you succeed. And everybody wants to do what you're saying. But don't be a steamroller. Don't treat people like garbage while you're telling them what to do. Mm. And that really hit me hard. Um, and that's something that, uh, as you know, Shane, we've talked recently about this. I'm still working on uh, mitigating my desire to get from point A to point B with, okay, maybe the right way to do things in this situation is to make sure we're all coming along together. And that is a lifetime for a type one to learn and implement. Uh, those in the orbit of a type one will feel that steamrolling piece sometimes a lot, depending on who. Just ask my husband. So, but I also want everyone to understand how when you feel a type one's been hard on you, it's probably true. But I also want you to understand how hard a type one is on themselves. Mm. Very hard on themselves. And so 
uh, wants to make sure it's done right, wants to make sure it's perfect, it has to be done a certain way, hard on you if you're around that sometimes, but, and sometimes when you just don't know how to deal with that and you want to know how to pray for them, uh, pray that they wouldn't be so hard on themselves because mm -hmm. it's, it's a major part. It's a major part. So uh, lastly, as you kind of you know, view your relationship with God and, and as you walk with Christ, how does your type one, your type oneness uh, kind of affect how you see God and how you, how you relate to, to God? Well, um, as we've also talked recently, every type one will have their own concept of what is right and what mm -hmm. is perfect. And I think type ones try to manifest in the world the perfection that we think we see is missing in God. <laughs> Yes. Which is very prideful, right? <laughs> so I'm extremely grateful that I grew up in a, I happened to grow up in a Lutheran tradition, which emphasized that we are saved by God's grace mm -hmm. alone and not by anything we can do. So I'm so grateful that my concept of a right or a good world is one that's drenched in grace, um, a world sustained by a God who is deeply aware of the hard and broken realities we live in. So I've had to adopt a repeated refrain that God has grace for even this, mm. for even me, for even that person. Um, and so to me, God's grace often looks like patience. And to me, I see and experience God's patient and life-giving and restorative work in creation. Um, creation takes its time. I mean, if you think about the time it takes for a river to carve a canyon through rock, that's a prime example of God's mm -hmm. patience. And so, um, yeah, this has really shaped my relationship with God where it, it throws me on God's grace, and then I try to share and spread that grace mm -hmm. with others. So if I'm spending time connecting with God in creation, and creation includes people too, um, I, I try to learn from God to be less of a steamroller and more of a gardener. Mm. Super important. And so type ones, uh, lots, lots to learn there. So Torah, thank you. Let's give Torah a hand. Uh, appreciate you. Thank you. I'll take that. Thank you so much. So what we're going to do is, um, I want to pray a prayer of thanks for the eights, nines, and ones amongst us because we, we are truly the beautiful body of Christ because of these folks. Bring so many different facets of love and grace and service and justice and all the beautiful stuff that the church is. And so we've, all, we've seen glimpses of them, and I want to take a moment just to thank God for them. So I'm going to pray. Uh, I'm going to pray for the eights and the nines. Uh, Yvonne, you know what it's like to live with one. So I'm going to ask that you would pray the grace that Tor just talked about on the ones. And uh, once we've prayed, I'm going to ask Vanessa and her team to come back just to quickly lead us in a, one last song, and then we'll wrap our time up today. So Jesus, we are so mindful of the beauty of the body of Christ. Uh, Lord, today as we, we hear the teaching in it, as we see the people and hear the voices and see the faces, oh God, thank you that the glory of God radiates through each one of them. Stamped with your divine image they are. So God, for the eights, just wants to get it done and make it right and bring justice. Uh, Lord, thank you for them, because that justice comes from you, from your heart. So God, I pray you would help them to continue to pursue that, but I also pray you would help them to find ways to keep that in check uh, so that those things come out appropriately with others, not in front of others, not telling others what to, how to, that looks in their lives, but Lord, just how to kind of channel that in a way where the eight can be pushing us forward in ways where we need to be moved forward. Uh, but in ways that also respect the body uh, that they are a part of. God, for the type 9 peacemakers, thank you, Lord, because they are just so concerned when there's people at odds and when there's tension in the room and when there's things going wrong in the church or in the family. Lord, they are, they are geared towards fixing that. Thank you for them, because if it weren't for them, boy, what a mess. What a mess we'd be in today. Uh, Lord, thank you for their in, inner desire to just want to bring peace, because peace is who you are. Are. Jesus, you're the Prince of Peace. And when they show peace to us, it's a strong reflection of who you are. So God, I pray for them today. Thank you for them. And God, bring more of them our way. We need more of them in our world today. And Father, for the 
those that reflect upon themselves as the reformer, the perfectionist type. I thank you, God, that I've had the blessing for 24 years to live with someone who I know at all costs will protect and provide and do everything necessary for our home and family. And I thank you for that personality type that that goes above all and uh, and just keeps that going and keeps things moving and is just so dedicated and so loyal. So I thank you for those traits. But I pray, God, for those that see themselves in that way, God, that are so incredibly hard on themselves. I pray, God, that they would learn to be gentle with their own self. And I pray, God, that you would send people along their path, Lord God, to just give them a blessing of encouragement and a blessing of, hey, we've seen what you're doing. And, and not just a trite pat on the back because, God, they'll see through that. But someone that will just come along and just give an in-depth, meaningful comment to them when they need it, God, of, of that, you're, that, that they've been seen and that what they're doing has been seen. So I pray, God, that you will help them and bless them. And I thank you, God, so much for those people in our world and in our congregation, God, that will just continue to work and work and work and just be so dedicated to that. And I pray that you will bless all that they do and all that they touch and that you'll just be with them and bless them. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody who participated, that's awesome. Um, we're